Okay, so thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, so what I want to talk about is um, a generalization of something called the Chalice-Selberg formula. And so the only logical place for me to start is by telling you what the Chalice-Selberg formula is. So I actually want to state it in two different ways. Um, the first one is maybe the, the, the original formulation is much easier to give. Um, so, so H is going to be the complex upper half plane. And uh, everybody's favorite function on the upper half plane already appeared in Frank Caligari's talk. It's Ramanujan's modular discriminant. So delta is the holomorphic function on the upper half plane defined by delta of tau is q times the product for n is 1 to infinity of 1 minus q to the n to the 24th power, where q is e to the 2 pi i tau. Um, so this is a, uh, the first example you learn of a modular form. And when you first learn about modular forms, you learn that they can be viewed as uh, homogeneous functions on the space of lattices. So I want to think of this as a function on the space of lattices in the complex numbers as follows. So view as a function on lattices in C. Uh, by writing, so any lattice, I can choose generators for it. So write it as z e1 plus z e2. And you can always choose the generators in such a way that e1 over e2 lies in the upper half plane. And then you take that point in the upper half plane and evaluate Ramanujan's discriminant there. Set. Delta of L to be delta of E1 over E2. Okay. And then um, sort of non-obvious fact is that this satisfies the following transformation law. If I rescale the lattice, then it rescales the discriminant by a factor of the minus 12th power of the, the homothety, the scaling factor. So here's the first statement of the Chalice-Selberg formula. So this was in 67. So take a quadratic imaginary field. I'm going to call my quadratic imaginary fields E. So Q adjoin the square root of D d negative, then you have the following very mysterious equality. 1 over 24 times the size of the ideal class group of E times the sum over L in the ideal class group of the log of the absolute value of delta L, delta L inverse is equal to one half times the logarithmic derivative of some L function at zero, uh, and then some little fudge factor minus a half log two pi. Okay. So I have to tell you what the ideal class group is. So the class group is just uh, the set of all finitely generated OE submodules L in E, modulo all of the principal such things. So 
some finite group whose elements are represented by <coughs> lattices in E, which I can view as lattices in the complex numbers. So I'm always thinking of this as I have a fixed embedding inside the complex numbers. So that's some finite collection of lattices. And uh, the L function, OK, so what is chi E? So chi E is the, the quadratic Dirichlet character determined by my quadratic imaginary field. So it's a function from Z mod DZ cross to plus or minus 1. And by Dirichlet's theorem on primes in arithmetic progressions, to, to tell you what this is on all elements of Z mod DZ cross, it's enough to tell you what it is on prime elements, prime numbers. So chi E of a prime P, not dividing D, it's, it's minus 1 if when I take P and look at the ideal of my quadratic imaginary extension generated by it, if it's still prime. And it's 1 if that ideal is not prime. And if it's not prime, then it factors as some prime ideal times its complex conjugate. So that's what chi E is. And then the L function is just Dirichlet's L function. So L S chi E is the product over all P, not dividing D, of 1 over 1 minus chi E P, P to the minus S, which converges when the real part of S greater than 1 and has holomorphic continuation, so it makes sense to talk about L prime over L. And it's non-vanishing at L equals 0, S equals 0. <clears throat> so this is the first statement of the charlotte selberg formula. And um, when I look at that, I think, I think even today, it doesn't, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me. I mean, it's, it's just some very special function evaluated at some special points, and then some other special function evaluated at some special points. And, you look at it, and it's not clear how, it, how you might generalize it in any way. And I think, to some extent, the reason it's not obvious how you would generalize it is because, I mean, you could, you could generalize the right-hand side in lots of ways. We attach L functions to everything in sight in number theory. But on the left-hand side, Ramanujan's discriminant is, is a very, very, very special thing. I mean, it's, it's, and so if you want to generalize this, you, you somehow want to write it in a way that doesn't involve the discriminant anymore at all. And then it, the left-hand side looks less like a fluke and more like something systematic. And <clears throat> an interpretation of the left-hand side, um, it, it, in terms of uh, periods of abelian varieties, first appeared, at least in writing, uh, in Dick Gross's Harvard PhD thesis. But he, he credits the idea to, he said he's learned it from Deline, who just never bothered to write it down. But somehow Deline's observation was that you can, you can think of the left-hand side, it's, it's actually computing something called Faulting's Heights. So, Faulting's Heights. Um, so now, let's let, k, k is always going to be any subfield of the complex numbers. Um, okay, so it, this is the first talk is supposed to be a, a colloquium style talk. So it's never clear what that means. What, what should you assume? What should you not assume? I, I'm going to err on the side of starting from the beginning. So definition, an elliptic curve over K is a, I mean, I mean somehow if you know what all of these words mean, you also know what an elliptic curve is. But the proper smooth, geometrically connected. Algebraic curve over K of genus one. Let's, let's call the thing A, because it's, soon it's going to be a general abelian variety and not an elliptic curve <coughs> of genus one A with some chosen point called zero, defined over k. Um, all of which is just a fancy way of saying 
you have an algebraic curve over k, such that when you take its complex points, you get a torus. So, C modulo a lattice. And, okay, I mean, so uh, you can always choose a virus Ross equation for it, any such A has the form. It's given by some equation, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are in k, are such that uh, the thing that I can never quite remember, 4a cubed plus 27b squared is non-zero, which is the condition that guarantees smoothness. Um, and then here's a, here's a fact. So the first fact I won't even write down. Every such thing has a, a unique structure of algebraic group, uh, unique given the condition that you declare that this is the identity for the group law. And then once you know that your elliptic curve actually has a group structure, you can talk about its endomorphism ring. Tensor it with Q to get some Q algebra. And because everything, is in, everything that I've defined is in characteristic zero, there aren't that many possibilities for what this can be. It's either just Q itself or a, a quadratic imaginary field. And in this case, we say that uh, A has complex multiplication. And so what I want to explain is that the left-hand side is really computing Faulting's heights of elliptic curves with complex multiplication. So given an elliptic curve over a finite extension of Q, I want to explain how to attach some invariant to it, the Faulting's height. So here's what you do. Um, choose a non-zero algebraic differential form uh, that I'm going to call eta. So a global section of the sheaf of differential one forms. Uh, whatever this, I mean, it's a one-dimensional k-vector space. Um, so assume a over k. A is an elliptic curve over k with k over q finite. And I mean, this is, I mean, if A is given by a virus cross equation, you can just write such a thing down easily. So eg, eta is just dx over y. You can choose that one. And now if I, if, I mean, I said that k was a subfield of the complex numbers, but there's nothing to stop me from choosing, look at all of its embeddings into the complex numbers. And every time I choose an embedding of k into the complex numbers, I get a new elliptic curve over the complex numbers and a new holomorphic one form. So each embedding of k into c gives an elliptic curve, a sigma over C. Let me write a sigma of C with a holomorphic one form, eta sigma on it. And so then you can, you can form the, I mean, my title is, is periods of abelian varieties. Here's a period. I'm going to define the Archimedean part of the faulting site, h infinity fault a eta which is just you run over all the embeddings of k. For every embedding, you have some holomorphic one form. You wedge it with its complex conjugate. You integrate. You get some number. And then you add up all the logs of those. So log absolute value of the integral a sigma of c, eta sigma wedge, eta sigma conjugate, sum over all the embeddings, and then throw in a normalization factor minus 1 over 2 times the degree of k over q. Which is almost the faulting's height, except 
this visibly depends on what my choice of eta was. And so now we want to correct this by, by adding on another term that's going to remove the dependence on eta. And to do that, I mean, you have to normalize eta in some way. And you, you, it's very difficult to do it uh, just talking about elliptic curves over fields. You really need a theory of elliptic curves at least over the ring of integers of your number field k. And once you've sort of opened that box, you might as well go all out and work over an arbitrary scheme. So let s be any scheme. <clears throat> an elliptic curve. Over s is any smooth proper morphism from some scheme to s together with a section called zero, such that fiber by fiber on the base, it gives you an elliptic curve. Every fiber AS is an elliptic curve in the sense already defined over a field. I've got the shadow shooting. Ah. OK. Um, OK, so now when I, I, to complete the definition of the faulting site, I'm going to cheat a little bit. And I'm only going to do it for elliptic curves that have everywhere good reduction, in the sense that I can take my elliptic curve over k and extend it to an elliptic curve over the ring of integers. So assume a. K extends to an elliptic curve over the full ring of integers. So I could talk about its reduction mod any prime, for example. Well, once I have this extension, I, I, can, I can look at its global algebraic differential forms. So now, when I choose this eta, I'm going to choose it to be a global section on this extension. So this is some uh, finitely generated projective OK module that's sitting inside of the one-dimensional K vector space that we already had. And now I can define the, the finite part of the faultings height and it's just you you again there's going to be a normalizing factor but the main point is it's the log of the cardinality of this OK module, module the submodule generated by that element. And then you add that on to this period integral, the dependence on eta cancels out, and you've got the faulting's height. So now H fault is the sum of these two terms. So this was introduced by Faultings in more generality. I mean, he did it for uh, abelian varieties over number fields he, in the, the proof of his, Mordell, of his proof of the Mordell conjecture. Um, so I mean, a, a, a typical kind of finiteness theorem that Faultings proved is, and this is much weaker than what he proved, but um, if you fix a number field and fix any constant, there are only finitely many elliptic curves over your number field with everywhere good reduction, whose faulting site is below that constant. Although, I mean, to prove that for elliptic curves, you need, I mean, as I was preparing this talk, I thought, surely just for elliptic curves, there must be a more ele elementary proof of this. And I actually saw, there's a paper of Joe Silverman where he gives a, a, an elementary proof of this that doesn't require much of anything beyond what's in his books on elliptic curves. Okay, so now, with the faulting site in hand, I can restate the chalice Selbert formula in a way in which the Ramanujan's discriminant magically disappears, and it starts to look like something that one might be able to, to generalize. So here's Charles Selberg. Ah. 
after Deline and Gross. So suppose we take a finite extension of Q, and A is an elliptic curve. K, whose endomorphism ring is the, the full ring of integers for some imaginary quadratic field. Then The faulting's height is, well, it's basically the same as the right-hand side of the previous version of Charles Elberg. The logarithmic derivative of this Dirichlet L function at zero, and then a fudge factor, which is now minus a quarter log four pi squared times the discriminant d. So to me, that's an improvement. Because now the left-hand side, you can say, well, you know, if instead of having an elliptic curve, what if I just try and put in an arbitrary abelian variety? In, in your other description, you didn't have delta. In my other description? I mean, so suppose it's a pure person with a pure person. Yes. That's correct. So the delta magically disappeared. If, I mean, <laughs> I actually, I, this is really hard to find in the literature and in the, in the notes for this. I actually wrote it down very carefully, I think. The point is that, I mean, you have this, why does, what, the, the question isn't where did the determinant go? The question is why was it appearing in the first one at all? And the answer is on the, on the modular curve, you have the line bundle of weight one modular forms and it has some faultings metric on it. And that metrized line bundle, you can use that to compute faultings heights at any point. And the reason the discriminant ever appeared in the first place is simply because it gives you some convenient way of trivializing the 12th power of that line bundle. Does that mean that you could do some sort of operator called delta to compute the line bundle? Presumably, yeah. Well, OK, right. The catch is the thing that's special about the discriminant is that now work on the integral model of the modular curve. It's really a trivialization of the line bundle. It has no divisor. So if you stick in like some arbitrary modular form, there's going to be some analog of the original chalice Selberg statement with the discriminant replaced by your modular form, but it's also going to involve some extra term, which is you take the divisor of your modular form on the modular curve, and you have to take its scheme theoretic intersection with like Zariski closures of CM if points. You're level one. If you're level That's one, level. but it, your modular form could still have a. Oh, I see. Uh, you right. mean because the, because its genus zero is what you're thinking? So. Mm. No, no. I'm really using the fact that delta has no, has trivial divisor. So if you show me another modular form with trivial divisor, there's going to be a chalice Selberg formula for that. But if it has a non-trivial divisor, it's going to be more complicated because this is actually, this is going to come up in my second talk where I'm going to explain essentially this argument, but the modular curve is going to be replaced by an orthogonal Shimura variety. And there's going to be a similar line bundle of modular forms. And there's no canonical way to trivialize it or any of its powers. And so you have some substitute, which is Borchard's products. And well, that's for the second talk. I mean. OK. Um, right, so I started at 25 after. So I, so I have 15 minutes. OK. So right. OK, so onward to higher dimensions. So. This form of the Chalice Selberg formula, there's a conjectural extension of it to higher dimensional abelian varieties that was formulated, formulated by Comes. So that's what's next. Um, okay, so definition an abelian variety over our field K. Uh, let, let me just say, uh, is a smooth, proper 
group variety. So just imagine some smooth, compact group, smooth, compact variety with a group structure on it. Um, so for example, an abelian variety of dimension one is just an elliptic curve. And if, uh, if I have an abelian variety of dimension D, then, well, it's complex points. It's just going to be some complex torus. It's C to the D modulo some lattice again. Now, I, I won't even rewrite the definition of Falting's height. Take the same definition, except uh, I've erased it, but there were, there were one forms. You just take top degree algebraic differential forms. And everything works the same. You have a top degree algebraic differential form, so when you take the complex points, you get a top degree holomorphic form, so when you wedge it with a conjugate, you get a top degree smooth form, which you can then integrate. And Definition is the same. Just replace elliptic curve by abelian variety everywhere. Again, I'm going to cheat and assume that my abelian variety actually extends to the an abelian variety over the whole ring of integers. But that's just a cheat. It's not really necessary to assume that. It's just for simplicity. You choose this. You replace the one by a d, and everything's the same. Still have faulting sites. Um, what's the analog of complex multiplication? So that requires a little bit of explanation. So an abelian variety over our field K is said to have complex multiplication if there exists some field extension E over Q of degree twice the dimension, so D is the dimension, such that you can embed E into the endomorphism algebra. With Q. So 2D is the largest possible field extension that you can ever embed into one of these things. Okay, and then when this happens, this E has some very special properties. So E is what's called a CM field, which just means that E has no real embeddings, so it's totally imaginary. but it's a quadratic extension of some other f, which has only real embed. All of its complex embeddings lie in the real numbers, so totally real. So that's the definition of a CM field. A, quadratic, a totally imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field. And if E acts on A, then it also acts on the Lie algebra of A. So the induced action of E on, let's take, the, let's take the Lie algebra of the complex points, which is, of course, C to the D. So the action is always diagonalizable. sense that uh, it's given by E maps into D by D matrices by sending alpha to some diagonal matrix, alpha, sorry, uh, sigma phi, phi, phi one of alpha, phi D of alpha, where this capital phi, which is the collection of these embeddings, So whatever D embeddings, I mean, E has degree 2D. So it has 2D embeddings into the complex numbers. It's acting on a D-dimensional vector space, so only half of them can appear here. And 
whatever half appears, they have the property that when you restrict them down to this f, they're all distinct. So phi1 through phi d uh, give uh, all d embeddings of f into the real numbers. When you restrict them to f, they're all different. So this, this property, we said that phi is a CM type of E. Or equivalently, home EC is the disjoint union of phi with all of the conju complex conjugate embeddings. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a theorem of Colnez. If A uh, has, well, let's say if, if A has dimension D and CM by E, and assume that, I mean, CM just meant that after you tensor with Q, you can map E in, but I really want to assume that we can do it with the, the full ring of integers is mapping into the endomorphism ring. Then, so there's something I didn't say back here. I mean, look at this. The right-hand side doesn't care about your abelian variety. It only, uh, your elliptic curve, it only cares about the field E. So in particular, this faulting side didn't depend on which elliptic curve you had with complex multiplication by E. So the same thing is true here. If A has complex multiplication by the full ring of integers, and uh, CM type phi, then the faulting's height only depends on the pair E phi. Doesn't care which actual abelian variety we're looking at. And as soon as you write that, an immediate question leaps to mind. I mean, if this faulting site only depends on some sort of purely Galois theoretic data, can you give a formula for the faulting site that visibly depends only on the Galois theoretic data? And that's exactly what Colmez's conjecture does. So I've got five minutes to tell you Colmez's conjecture. 50, oh, really? Oh, great. Oh, right, I started right, okay, yeah. That's even better. Phew. I was getting worried there. <laughs> okay. Phew. I did that. Um, all right. So let's let's set. So to remind you of Colmes's theorem, I'm going to write the faulting site of the pair E phi for the faulting site of any abelian variety as in the theorem, having complex multiplication by the full ring of integers of E and CM type phi. Okay. Okay, this is Colmez's conjecture. This is fun. It's, uh, it's very mysterious. So, the, the automorphism group of the field C acts on, on the set of all embeddings of E into C in, in an obvious way. Therefore, it also acts on the set of all CM types. Okay. So I'm going to define a function that I'm going to call A. It, it depends on the pair E phi. It's going to be a function from the automorphism group of C to the integers. And here it is. It's really simple. A of some automorphism G is you take the CM type phi, you translate it by G, and you count the size of the intersection. Okay. 
Um, so it's easy to check that this, this factor is through um, some function, the, the Galois group of, uh, so script E, let's say, for some script E. Namely, you can just take all of the embeddings of E into the complex numbers and take their compositum. And this function will, sorry? Yes, it's a number field, yeah. Okay. And now I take this function, and uh, there's something I don't, it's not necessarily constant on conjugacy classes, which you regard as a defect. So now you fix that by just averaging over all conjugacy classes. There, now I have a function that's constant on conjugacy classes. Okay. Uh, elementary finite group theory. The characters of the irreducible representations of a finite group form a basis for the space of class functions. So, like whatever this function is, I can write a zero of G as some sum over chi of some multiplicity of the trace of chi of G, where chi runs all over all the irreducible finite dimensional representations of this finite group. Now, every one of those finite dimensional irreducible representations has an L function attached to it. And I'm going to define, so I don't remember what Colmez calls this, it's something like H, but I'm going to call it the Colmez height of the pair E phi is you take the sum over those representations with the same multiplicities, but you throw in this logarithmic derivative where this is just the Artin L function. L S chi is the product over all primes one over the determinant of the identity minus p to the minus s times chi at the, the Frobenius element for, for p in the Galois group. I mean, with appropriate correction terms for the ramified primes. If, if you don't know what this means, I mean, every finite dimensional representation of a Galois group, you can attach an L function to it, defined as some infinite product over the prime numbers. Right, and here's the conjecture. So in the, in, the same, in the same paper where he proved that theorem that the faulting site only depended on E and phi, he proposed the following. This strange, mysterious thing actually computes the faulting height. Um, so let me mention one thing. I mean, what, this, this is kind of crazy. I mean, it's not clear wh where did this come from? And I, I mean, I asked Colmez about this once, and he said that, that he, was, he was less proud of the conjecture than the way in which he was led to the conjecture. And the way that he was led to it is, is something like the following. So I've already defined, in the definition of the faulting's height, there was some sort of 
Archimedean period integral. You integrate holomorphic forms over the complex points of your abelian variety. So what he did in this paper is define certain p-adic periods for every prime p in addition to the Archimedean period. These p-adic periods, they don't lie in the complex numbers. They lie in one of Fontaine's big rings. They're in Biderom plus. And so for every prime p, there's some p-adic period, and they all live in different rings. But his idea was that, well, if you multiply all of these things together, including the Archimedean period, you should get one. Well, they all lie in different rings, so you can't multiply them together. Fine. But every ring in which every one of these things lives has an absolute value on it. Great. Let's take the absolute values of all of them, multiply those together. You should get one. OK, the product diverges. OK, let's, let's normalize it in some way. And so he found a way to normalize it and then conjectured that after you normalize this product, you get one, and then unwound that and ended up with this somehow. And these, I mean, you can see, OK, there's a product overall prime. So that kind of, that's, you know, my story checks out there. And somehow this, this is only defined for you know, real part of S sufficiently large, but then you have to use analytic continuation. And that analytic continuation is part of his normalization of the infinite product. And so he, it's, he's right. He was very clever. So, anyway. OK. Um, if. This CM field E is a Galois extension of Q, and the Galois group is abelian. Then uh, Colmez proved this himself, up to some error term involving some log twos, and then the error term was removed by uh, Andrew Obis, then proved by Colmez plus Obis. And I mean, without writing anything, let me just say in words, what's special about the case of an abelian extension? The thing that's special about an abelian extension is that um, you can, in, to prove this, you're always free to uh, enlarge the field E a little bit. And the Kronecker-Weber theorem says that uh, whenever you have an abelian extension of Q, it's always contained in some cyclotomic field. So you can assume in the abelian case that E is actually Q adjoins some n roots of unity. Somebody's phone is ringing. Um, OK, now if you, if you look at, if you want an abelian variety with complex multiplication by a cyclotomic field, you, you can start with the Fermat curve. The automorphism group of this curve visibly contains a copy of the nth roots of unity in it, just acting on the coordinates, which means the Jacobian of this curve contains an action of the ring Z mu n, which is the full ring of n. So, so you can construct a very concrete abelian variety with complex multiplication in the abelian case by taking the Jacobian of a Fermat curve. And then these, these faultings heights, you can realize them as actual period integrals, not on the Jacobian, but on the Fermat curve itself. And there are formulas for these period integrals uh, that are due to, to David Rorlich um, and Robert Coleman. Um, and so Colmez used those formulas for periods on the Fermat curve to deduce this in the abelian case. And then uh, Tong Hai Yang proved some cases where E is a degree four extension uh, and is not Galois. And he did this by um, computing, by, by doing some sort of elaborate arithmetic intersection theory calculations on a Hilbert modular surface. And that method is the one that was used by me and Fabrizio Andriata and Eyal Gorin and Kirti Metapusi Para to prove the following. So, okay, I, I'm not going to write it. The names are too long. Andriata, Gorin, me, Kirti counts twice. And, and then, as we were doing this, a different proof appeared due to, uh, whoa, not you and Yuan, <laughs> and Shou Zhang. So it was a race. We all won. Six people, two proofs. It says, 
uh, for any, if you hold E fixed, if you take the faultings height of E phi, but you sum over all the CM types, that's equal to the same when you sum over all of the Comez heights. Um, Colmez certainly, he knew, he might have even said in his paper, that this case where you sum over all of them um, should be more accessible than the, he thinks the general case for, for context, for those who know what Stark's conjectures are, he said that he, he views his conjecture as comparable both in spirit and in difficulty to Stark's conjectures. Hard, in other words. But he already knew that this average case should be easier because he noticed that this, that this side that involves all of the L functions simplifies drastically when you sum over all the possible CM types. So the right-hand side is simple. You just do the following. Um, okay, so recall we've got our CM field E. It's some degree two extension of this totally real field F. Everything is sitting inside of Q bar, so I can, there's, there's sort of an obvious one-dimensional Galois representation floating around. I can take the, the Galois group of Q bar over F that surjects onto the Galois group of E over F, which is not very interesting, it's just plus or minus one, which is sitting inside of GL1C. There's a one-dimensional representation of this Galois group. You can induce it up to the larger Galois group induce to get some d-dimensional representation of the Galois group of q bar over q. And the right-hand side is just, there's only one Art and L function that appears. It's the Art and L function of this induced representation. It's about the easiest kind of Art and L function you can imagine. The right-hand side is just L prime zero this chi over L zero chi. So the right-hand side is easy, so maybe you have some hope of actually computing the left-hand side, and uh, that, so the, my, the, the entirety of my second talk will be um, sketching some aspects of the proof of this. So I'll stop there for now. <laughs>